artist here in New York City. And this is four by four. Four things every Enneagram four needs to know on a given topic given by a four. I'm a four, I'm a sexual four, a one-on-one -on -one four. And I am going today to be speaking not just to fours, but to nines. So I just did a bunch of episodes on the nines. They're my second favorite number. I have many nines in my life. Just off the top of my head, I can think about six or seven great friends, best friends. And also I have a ton of clients who are nines. So I decided to start branching off doing other numbers and I started with the nines. They're the number I want to understand the best. They're also one of the most difficult numbers to understand. I said this in a couple of the other episodes on nines, it's like they're vapor. It's sometimes hard to grab hold of them. There's not a lot of solid pieces sometimes to grab hold of and, and make sense of. But I find that tons of fours connect with tons of nines. And I know if I'm in the indication that the amount of nines I have in my life, not only as clients, but friends and family, there's something to this. And as I've talked to fours and nines over the years, I found that many are in romantic relationships together, friendships together, working relationships together, that they somehow seem to gravitate towards each other. The interesting thing is, nines can have the hardest time typing, figuring out what their number is in the Enneagram world. But I find that fours sometimes, when they see it, they know it. And so there's this weird complementary piece of this, like sometimes, what am I? And I know exactly what I am. And I see that that plays out in the relationship in general. That there's a lot of odd compliments that happen. And even to the point of how we communicate, a four is usually really direct in their communication, want to be known, want to be understood, want to be heard. And nines can be very indirect, very passive with their words. And so I want to take, take a deep dive into this world. I'm not going to cover all the bases, but let's just look at a couple things right off the bat. <clears throat> um, one is, I had a client recently ask me a nine who said, do you think fours are attracted to gut people? Now, the gut people, if we have that triad, it's the eights, nines, and ones. Now, we're heart people, fours, so that's the twos, threes, and fours. Now, why might fours be attracted to gut people? Well, eight, nines, and ones do this. <clears throat> they say, here I am deal with me. They do it in different ways, but they, they each kind of present as open and this is what I am. Nothing different. Take what you got. They often live in the present. They're not overly consumed with the past or overly consumed with the future. They can be, at times, and maybe not nines as much as I just talked about the indirect communication. But they can be a bit more direct, sometimes aggressive, and demand their territory. So even you nines want to kind of own your territory. You don't want to be controlled. And fours really respect that, I think. The eights, nines, and ones not, are not overly verbal. Fours are super verbal. You also are often going to know where you stand with an eight, nine, or one. So specifically, a nine can have times where there's a lot of passive aggressive going on. But for the most part, we know where we stand. And so the four is attracted to these things. They're attracted to that kind of authenticity of take it or leave it. This is what I am. They don't want somebody wearing a bunch of masks because their pursuit is authenticity and originality. Now, nines might have a difficult time with the passion of the four. The fever kicks and the screams, the, like the intensity of the four, but also they can't get enough. Why? No offense to you nines, but I think it adds a layer of in intrigue to your life. At times nines can be pretty boring, routine, 
uh, status quo, don't ruffle the feathers of life too much. And fours are constantly getting into different dilemmas and passions and things that they're going to talk about and interested in. They're going to have ups and downs. And so the nine has to kind of ride with that. But it also makes the nine's life a little bit more interesting and a little less comfortable. Now, fours may really dislike the aloofness of the nine, the inability of the nine to take hold of what they're into and then go put it into the world. But we can't also, well, that's a, maybe I'm going to do a double negative here. We also love <laughs> the slow sizzle of a nine and the understanding and comfort that the nine provides. I say it's like uh, taking Xanax, not that I take Xanax, but that kind of easing us out, easing the four out, taking us from here and here to a more of a bit of a flow. And as a friend or in a relationship, that easy road of the nine can translate into helping us kind of find some stability and rootedness. Now, another thing is nines pick up on energy when they walk in a room. Sometimes can't verbally describe it, but they know there's an energy, especially in specific people in a room, good and bad. Fours pick up on that same energy, usually can articulate what it is, but can often, because of their emotionality, jump to conclusions. So we might find dysfunction in somebody right away. I, I, I have nine friends, uh, not nine friends, but friends that are nine, that will know about me that I might walk into a room and start evaluating everybody. And then a year later, the person I evaluated as dysfunctional and that I wasn't going to be interested in as a friend or in a relationship, I'm really into. They, they, they sell me on themselves somehow. But as a four, I can often jump to conclusions because of that emotionality. I'm still picking up on some kind of energy, but I might describe a thing as dysfunctional. Now, I find that nines... Uh, will give the benefit of the doubt. Why fours can often rule a person out. It's an interesting thing, right? These nines might go, ah, that person struggles and they're hard to be with, but, and the four might say, oof, I just can't, it's too much, that person out. Now, the counter type, the self-preserving fours, you guys can often allow some folks in that are harder to deal with just like a nine would. So in that, there is some camaraderie there. I think both can include people instantly. So they can make friends very quickly. So when they know what they like, even if they don't know why they like it, they might include. So these are just a few of the things that I just wanted to start off with as an intro. I'm gonna give you this quote by Roka. You guys know that I end all of my episodes with a Rilke quote. So I'm going to throw out this because I think it's important for us to root ourselves in, okay? I think fours and nines need each other. The four needs the, uh, the slow pace and the limited emotional range of a nine. That swinginess isn't there for the nine as much. And you nines, well, you guys need us to, to poke you and prod you at times and to inspire and, and uh, incite passion. And so Rilke talks about tension and doing the hard thing. And here's the quote. People have, with the help of conventions, oriented all their solutions towards the easy and towards the easiest side of easy. But it is clear that we must hold to what is difficult. Everything alive holds to it. Everything in nature grows and defends itself in its own way and is characteristic, characteristically and spontaneously itself. Seeks at all costs to be so and against all opposition. And what Rilke is trying to say is we need tension. We need the weather to be changed, the climate to change, seasons. And I think fours and nines do that for each other so that they can work against 
the negative opposition and utilize positive tension or necessary suffering to grow more themselves. So I'm going to try to give us four different ways to look at it in our four by four world that I've tried to open up for you guys. And hopefully you come on the journey and take a deep dive with me into the nines and the fours relationship combo. All right, let's get into it. All right, let's start at the top. Now, literally, I mean, let's start at the top. I call this Polar Express. And we have you nines, you live up in the North Pole. You're perched up there at the top of the Enneagram. And you are part of this perfect triangle with the, the threes and the sixes. And you're at the top of the circle. And this Polar Express moves from the North Pole down to the South Pole where us fours and fives are. Now, the way I visualize this is that, in a sense, you nines are the least encumbered with internal strife, with uh, complicated emotional range. And as you've let yourself kind of dilute down, you ultimately end in the bottom with us fours and fives who are the most complicated, the most emotional range, and the most difficulty dealing with those emotions. It's, it's like a pinball game where the pinball is shot out of the top and it gets banged around all the way down to the bottom and then your game is over. <laughs> and some people have called the fours and fives down there at the bottom, like living in uh, the valley close to falling off the edge into hell. And sometimes we feel that. And so, it is kind of a trickle down. And I use that pinball analogy. I, if you've ever watched uh, Price is Right back in the day, uh, this game Blinko, they put a Blinko chip at the top and it just hits all of these, uh, I don't know, like metal, metal pipes along the way. And you might win a million dollars and you might win zero dollars, but it's banging up against everything on the way down. So if you look at the Enneagram, you have your nines, eights, and ones in that top corner of the or, or top part of the circle, and they tend to be the least complicated emotionally. Like even when I talk to a nine, I ask a nine how they're doing, they're like, everything's good, you know? They have an ability to confront people and just shed it off. Like there's not the same emotional baggage and ones are similar. And then you get to the sevens and the twos, and you have like the head optimist and the heart optimist. So we're still in that optimistic category, but they get a little bit more complex. Some more complexity there. The twos can have a lot of anger if you're not uh, appreciating what they're doing for you. And the sevens, uh, they're hiding a lot of their frustration and a lot of their um, facing the world and its hardships by running and running and running. So there's this complicated nature to these two. Then you have the six and the threes. Now, the six and the threes are the two sins that were added. Sixes are fear, uh, threes are deceit. And so they don't even fit into the seven deadly sins. There's these new two added and, and they're kind of complex. So, you know, how do you judge fear? How do you judge deceit? Because sometimes you're just lying to yourself. Sometimes it's not a straight lie. It's just a complicated thing you believe that you're presenting that isn't going to happen. And but you still believe it. And so it's this complicated world of complexity. And then we get to the fours and fives down there who are uh, they're shed of a lot of the defense mechanisms that have been banged off on the way down. And they're stuck with a lot of emotion and a lot of complexity and a lot of melancholy. So we go from, in a sense, the most unconscious and at, at times sleeping to themselves, to the most conscious. This, this complicated person who has a difficulty putting things in boxes and compartmentalizing and reducing things. And so there's this terminal nature to those bottom dwellers and something up top that is less dramatic. So there's like a piece to drama. And even in the name, it's the peacemaker to the individualist or the melancholic. 
Um, I also think that there's this overly asleep to overly awake. So this one's tuned in to the outside. Who am I apart from the connections to these other people, says the nine. You know, whether it's connections to the one-on-one, -on -one, if they're a sexual type, uh, connections to the group, or connections to my routines and the things I collect, if you're a self-preserver, down to the individualist who, well, <clears throat> they're all about the inside. So they're tuned into the inside while they're tuned into the outside. From repression and suppression to a feeling of oppression to at times a systematic optimism to a systematic pessimism to what's right to what's wrong so you see the tension of these polars playing out almost a tension of opposites but there's enough familiarity there and consistencies to feel at home with each other there is that not being overly masked, not being overly phony, not being overly slick. Um, you know, the nines can be maskless. They're considered the worst liars. Now, fours can lie, but they often choose not to because authenticity is the goal. So, again, it's least complex to the most complicated. Now, we all know that we're probably in every number, equally complicated. But in the obvious sense, fours seem to be most complicated. Even the numbers, you know, the number combos, four wing five, five wing four, uh, four wing three, three wing four, seem to be the most complicated. But the nine wing eights are super complicated too. So you have to look harder to see how complicated the nine is. And the fours are easier to see how complicated they are. Um, the fours, interestingly, can think they have an upper hand in the relationship. Because they have a broad emotional depth, they think that they can help the nine come out of their shell, find their passions, find their interests, find their heart and their emotions and all those words. So in our minds at times, nines are great projects. I'm sure my friends who are nines, and I know my clients, have felt like projects at times. But the, interestingly, uh, the interesting thing is us fours are, um, we're overemphasizing the sexiness of complication. We treat it like a new crypto. It's, it's worth a lot. It's going to be worth a lot. But the relationship is actually way more mutual. And at some level, our independence is equal. While we are the individual, the four, nines love their, they like their independence too and do not want to be controlled. Both of us don't love people relying on us for too much. It feels pressure filled. We're too honest about that weight. And it also makes us feel controlled. So it's no surprise we found each other. These two polars in this polar express that runs to and fro from north to south, south to north, there are a lot of connections and relationships and, and recuperation in each other, finding compliments in each other. That some of the human confusion of life is solved in our relationship together. That wilderness times can at some level be explained by the other. Sometimes the nines make it simple for us for us to understand and simplify the world a little bit. And sometimes you nines need us to complicate things a bit more so you can fiddle with the gadgetry internally and get into deeper subterranean regions of your heart. So those fours will illuminate for you what is hard for you to see. And you will illuminate for us, nines, what is hard for the four to see, which is sometimes the simple thing. Living in the present, not moving too far into the past or the future. All right, let's go on to number two. That was number one, Polar Express. All right, on to number two. I call this attention deprived. 
So nines and fours both have experienced uh, being attention deprived. We've handled it in very different ways, but there is this sense that we weren't given what we needed. And whether that happened in your household or it happened with your peers, I know for myself, it was primarily a peer relationship thing. I was rejected and often didn't feel like I fit in. And so there was this disconnection with peers, which later on in life made me want to get attention more and more. Now, maybe in your household, your parent wasn't going to meet your needs and you realized that at some level, probably unconsciously early on and started living in a way that didn't require them to meet it. So we both have this attention dep deprivation. And there is a certain level of attention hoariness that we have, but it is very covert for the nine, pretty obvious for the four. Let's look at it a little bit. Fours and nines both feel they didn't get that attention, but the nines don't feel like they have to be important where the four does. So the nine will self-delete and fuse with others, which can often end poorly, and not individuate, where the four really wants to individuate and become who they were meant to be, to differentiate themselves. So those two words, individuation and differentiation, which come from Carl Jung, are key to both of us. The nine needs to do more of it. The four is desperate to do it. Where the nine might defer, the four wants to decide. So fours took a different route, self-importance. Trying to find their uniqueness, authenticity, and be seen for it. And we'll often, this is why I think a lot of nines and fours get along, choose less competitive friends and relationships. We're not trying to get the same attention. So nines who tend to fuse with people are great for fours because fours don't want to often share the limelight. And fours are inherently impatient with getting some attention. Nines are inherently patient. I was talking to a nine yesterday on the phone and his kid was screaming in the background and he goes, yeah, you two are the same. You're both impatient. He was talking about me and his child. And at some level, the joke landed. I laugh because it's certain amount of it's true. That there is something about me at times that can be primitive. I want to get it done. I want to find the answer. I want to buy the thing. I want to build the project. I want to build the team. I want to get the house built. Where a nine can really be patient with that. So for nines, not getting proper attention to them often meant, I will never need someone. I won't be in need because people won't meet those needs. And so they can seem to not be needy, which again is great as a friend. A lot of nines have spent a lifetime stifling their voice and the need inside. Once a year, maybe they really need you. Maybe once a quarter if they're healthy. If they're, if they're really healthy, it's that once a quarter that they'll have a need, you know, four times a year. And sometimes they are so devoid of neediness that it's a delight. Now, the part that's hard for a four is we feel needy sometimes. So in contrast with you nines, it can feel really shame filled because we feel needy. And, you know, at times you guys don't seem to need anything. And so while we're both independent types and at some level probably have a disdain for overly needy people, um, we still have to get some of those needs met by each other. So when fours want to be wanted or are in need, they'll usually ask for it. And the nine is usually pretty responsive, which makes it a good combo. I think many of us fours are most comfortable showing that need to nines. You seem to be the safest with it and you seem to be 
least likely to need the attention of sharing it with others, right? The idea of gossip. We don't really worry that you're going to go tell a bunch of people because we don't think you have the need to go tell a bunch of people because we don't think you have the need to be really special or be held in some level of in the know like other people. Because the four is so differentiated and individuated, though, we become a very um, ideal partner for a nine. Unfortunately for them, you've chosen us fours, and we can also be very complicated with that and really desperate for it. And, and we want to aliven you to your individuation needs and differentiation needs. And like Rip Van Winkle, want to wake you up out of your slumber. Because we feel perpetually incomplete. And we see the incompletion in you. And we want to share this knowledge we have of purpose and passion. So again, that's why we gravitate towards nines. To agitate you into action at times. Now the thing that you love about us is that we seem to know what we want. Here's a, a, a Goth quote. I think this would be something that a nine would resonate with when they think about their four friends. I respect the person who knows distinctly what they wish. The greater part of all mischief in the world arises from the fact that people do not sufficiently understand their own aims. Us fours, especially when we are healthy, seem to know what we want, what we want to do, and we're pretty, pretty, pretty passionate about it. And that intrigues nines. I've had almost every nine in my life has enjoyed the passion I share for the things I'm into and ask me questions about that. They want to know how, how do these emotions connect to a thing or a person and build this fire. In relationships, nines have to watch out for letting people be the inspiring ones around them. And so therefore abdicate their responsibility to be inspirational themselves. Like I've said many times, nines can be a Xanax for us, like make us feel warm and safe and blanketed, our therapists without words. And the amount of accepting that you guys have given us fours, the room you've given us to be ourselves, the true healing and power of your gift to be at peace and in harmony, those soft clouds for us, is beautiful. But because you've given that to us, at times, us fours have let you get away with not being passionate enough about your own life. About not being carbonated enough or fizzy or bubbly. To not getting shaken and tingled and burned and choky and times when you have to spit up, you have so much uh, juice in your system. But hopefully you're receiving some of that from us. As we seek the peace in you and the safety in you, giving us room to run and to be known and seen and understood, we hope that we inspire you to be passionate and intrigued and challenged by life more. Okay. Enough of that. Let's go on to number three. All right, this part is called Strange Bedfellows. And we are, aren't we? We are Strange Bedfellows, us fours and nines. And I, I emphasize a bit in the beginning, those polar opposites, you know, the north and the south, and how there is this thoroughfare between the two. The idea of Strange Bedfellows has been used in literature throughout time. And the idea that adversity makes strange bedfellows in tough times, times of trouble, people who seemingly wouldn't associate with each other do. And in Shakespeare's The Tempest, there's this quote, my best way is to creep under his gabardine. There is shelter hereabout. Misery acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. There is obvious need for us together, this compatibility, this contradictory companions. 
reversed and re reconcilable. <laughs> but I think one of the things that's unique about that is partly when I communicate about adversity, I mean the adversity between us. Now, I've found with my friends who are nines that there can be sometimes some tension. That the four can stir up the anger and hostility of a nine, sometimes unlike other people. We have a special way. And so the nines are part of the hostile group. We are part of the shame group, us fours. Twos, threes, and fours are part of the shame group. But the hostile group is the eights, nines, and ones. Now they, the nines, show it the least. You just do. But it oozes out of you. And so if you are a gut type and you say, here I am, deal with me, I, you live in the present, there's a bit more directed, aggressive demand for territory, um, not high fear levels, which again, we appreciate. Fours don't love fear oozing out of people. But you're also not as verbal, and your desire is to make peace. The anger in which you show is often going to be passive. And when it is openly aggressive, it can be shocking. It can be kind of volcanic. And so the four, because we're so complicated, will err on the side of giving you space to be angry. We have so much shame in our life and are just happy we have good friends that often we'll let that be openly expressed. And so I found with nines, especially my friends, that they have a bit more open space to practice their anger. So to that question my client asked, are we fours more attracted to gut people? Yes, I think because of those reasons. We don't love to be around people with high levels of fear. We're overly verbal, so sometimes we don't need the overly verbal to be with, because if we're communicating a lot, sometimes we wanna be around somebody who's just more chill. We wanna know where we stand. We wanna know that you are here and deal with me. We wanna know what we're getting. So if you guys are almost considered the least angry type and fours can be a bit more open with their anger, then I think we're a great source for you because we sniff out anger. We, like you, can sense things. And so we tend to be able to see when anger is oozing out of people. Our emotional range is so sharp. So we know different notes that other numbers don't know. And so when you guys are either being passive aggressive or pulling away or, or ready to be a volcano, we might catch it beforehand and say, hey, what's going on? <clears throat> and we might actually help you put your flag down in self-assertion, giving you the freedom to have hard conversations. We notice just a little bit of anger. So, like I've said, you guys want to have a place where you could be naked and run around like little school children. And, well, there's also that part that is encumbered and is feeling heavy weight and isn't taking it easy, it is actually complicated and has a lot of energy. And so we let you put the ball out of the chute. We want you to be emotionally naked, not in the free bird way, but in the ability to share what's going on. To be a bit bothered and be able to share that bother and not have to be shamed by it or depressed by it or hide it. So again, we're all withdrawal types. Nines, fives, and fours, we all withdraw first. We often say, what's going on here? Pull back. And so if we're both withdrawing types, we might be able to see that a bit in others and seeing each other is the difficulty that they're struggling with. So it is not the most obvious intensity that the nine shows where 
for me as a sexual four, I might be the most obvious in my intensity. Yours is more subtle, but you often need somebody with high levels of gift at noticing that subtlety to help you pull it out. It is a blessing and curse to be in relationship with each other because of this. And that is why we are strange bedfellows. Because there is adversity there, but it is a healthy adversity that brings us actually together. We won't you bet, uh, let you be overly sleepy. We want you to be a bit more vigilant. And so we will try to get at that. Now, the nine wing eights, or the self-preserving nine, which tends to be a bit more concrete and maybe more comfortable in their boundaries and pushing back. Well, there might be a lot of intensity there between those two. Now, I'm a sexual four, which tend to be the most hmm, openly assertive or aggressive number considered in the all, all of the Enneagram out of all 27 types even more challenging at times than the eights and willing to go to battle. But you nine wing eights and you self-preserving nines, and you know who you are. I have one of my best friends is one of those. We can really go at it. Now it takes a lot to us for us to get there, but we've almost come to blows at times because we're both really highly aware of each other's dysfunction and also each other's anger. And so it can escalate. And we've had to be careful with each other. So you might have a nine wing eight in your life or a sexual four, and it takes a bit more understanding of how they show their aggressiveness. And that's not for this time together, but you might have a good conversation about that with each other to try to get deeper. Of, well, why does a sexual four openly show aggressiveness when they're hurt? Why is the nine wing eight or the self-preserving eight so connected to their eight challenger side and their need for concreteness? Maybe that's something to explore, but not for this time. Let's get into the last one. Number four, last uh, number three was strange bedfellows from uh, Shakespeare's um, Tempest. And now we'll go into the last one and conclude. All right, number four, this last part is called half obscurity. It's a term used by Kierkegaard back in the day. And when he is describing half obscurity, he's talking about a certain shut upness that we have. That there is too much possibility in the world and sometimes that overwhelms us and puts us into a position to pull back. And here's what I mean by that. Almost every nine and four I've talked to feel like there is some kind of late bloomership going on. That they've arrived to the party late, that they've been late out of the box. Now, the thing I love about the first and second half of life is that people who do a lot of internal work in the first half of life, the first 40 years of your life, well, the second 40 years of your life can be really fruitful and moved with a certain self-knowledge that others don't have. But if we do that work, sometimes it doesn't shoot us out of the box. Like, a, for example, an Enneagram 3 might that just is going after it from day one. And as Carl Jung said, we have to submit to descend and disappear at last into the night womb of the grave. You know, he's talking about the second half of life, but he's also talking about being, in a sense, reborn in your second half of life. I don't mean that in a religious sense, but I do mean that in a spiritual sense. As we do work early, we reap the rewards later. And so we have to grow by collisions and conflict and suffering and sorrow in that first half to really be rewarded in the second half. And I feel like in different ways, the nines and fours both do a lot of wrestling in the first half. And because of that, they sometimes have a failure to launch or an arrested development. And 
then they have to get to work, get to purpose. And often they do that later. Nines because they go to sleep on themselves. Fours because they are so emotional. They're so wrapped with emotion that it, it, they spend a, 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 a big part of their life just dealing with how to put these complex emotions in place so they have some stability and s security and rootedness. So for the nines and the fours, they often have to just start a project and stop thinking about it. Something that isn't managed by others. Something without the possibility of endlessly talking about it, but doing. Take action on your own behalf without all the other outside guardrails and outside voices. Now that's hard for a nine, but maybe it's even just an art project. that you get to the work of building confidence in yourself, fours and nines, of getting some shit done. Otherwise, your plans and your fantasies are a joke. And nines can be daydreamy, and fours can be fantasizers. We can live up here and think we're gonna do a thing, but it's talk. And so for both nines and fours, they have to move from having a bunch of things in their head to one or two that they could follow through on. I've seen many nines and fours dream big and produce small. Their bellies weren't big enough to fit all the food, but, but they had all the food in front of them, in a sense. All the ideas and the dreams. And so I want to go uh, with Goth's words again that I've used before, this healthy discomfort. We must plunge into experience and then reflect on the meaning of it. All reflection and no plunging drives us mad. All plunging and no reflecting, and we are brutes. And I'll take it a step farther with C.S. Lewis's words. The more often he feels without acting, or the, often, the more often you feel without acting, the less you will be able to ever act. And in the long run, the less you will be able to feel. Nines and fours can stay young together. Because we offer something to each other that's pretty unique and we don't want to lose it, we'll often let each other get away with being clanging symbols or aloof or apathetic because we want a friend or we want a relationship. And then there's a shared avoidance of leveling up of moving to the next level of responsibility and success even. Later in life, we can really cooperate and eradicate some of the ways we've fallen asleep or we've over dreamed or over fantasized or lived in a big picture that was too big that didn't have the proper steps. And we can keep each other accountable to taking step by step by step, like everybody else. You nines can seem to never start. You fours can play out all different things because you're into so much and don't zero in on a couple. And it can lead towards a fractured confidence and a delayed development. You know, for fours, there's random energies going everywhere. And for nines, you often aren't in touch with your energies. You don't know how to highlight them. And so both of us can look amateurish. There's heavy traffic inside for both of us. That leaves us playing false not notes and not the proper notes we need to, to be purposeful in this world. So nines, when you're holding down your turbulence, Know that you're also holding down some dreams and purpose and passion. And that holding down the turbulence is so hard to do, it's going to make you sleepy. And you'll think that the world is scary, so why not just go back to sleep, as one of my friends says. And that represents sleeping to self. It's common for all of us, but it's harder for you nines to get out of. The four often sees the world a scary too in a different way. We want to know about that scariness. <laughs> we want to know all about it. What are all the scary parts? But sometimes 
we'll spend so much time on figuring that all out that we won't zero in or narrow down in a certain way. And we will become half obscure to self and to our purpose. You know, for the four, that too much possibility can be overwhelming. But for the nine, too. So we have to turn up the consciousness, but also turn up the diving in. Becoming less obscure, more known, and more active. For nines, that's your responsibility, action. To tap into that three. But in a sense, it is for us fours, too, to tap into the one that is principled and disciplined and gets things done. We can both get blown off course so easy and live with the Jonah syndrome. Not wanting to go to Nineveh. I mean, it's in every religious and spiritual background, this idea that a whale swallows you up and spits you out into the place you're supposed to be. But we all want to be Jonah and hide away. And we do that with different complicated psychological defenses. So anyway, this is my challenge to you to both fours and nines start getting to the work of action. Yes, you can contemplate and like Goth says, reflect. But contemplation and action must be wed. All right, I ended off with a little heavy note, but I hope it's an inspirational note. Again, my name is Drew, and I'm a psychotherapist here in New York. If you want to do individual work, whether that be short-term or long-term, or even have a one-time uh, session in which we dig into this type of stuff, get in touch with me. You can get in touch with me with my face, or my uh, um, website, <laughs> drewnewkirk.com, or drew at drewnewkirk.com, or my Instagrams and both will pop up for you. Please subscribe if you're into this. It helps. I'm gonna keep on pumping out in Enneagram content. And hopefully you'll learn about other numbers too as I start to expand. It's gonna be a joy for me to expand and hopefully I get some good stuff out there. So thanks again and as always at the end of all these I say in the words of Raynar Marie Rilke, everything is yet to be done. Everything. Have a good one guys. Thanks for listening.